this week on Arizona Illustrated, Where Dreams Die. When the historians begin to write this chapter of American history, it's going to be a very sad chapter. The Red Road to Wellbriety. It gives them a place where the stigma is sort of removed. We're going to celebrate recovery. A haunting in Bisbee. One of the rumors that was always going around was that there was this energy like the Sedona Vortex. Remembering Bill Havens. He wrote a letter two weeks after he got back to Scotland. He was called out on a mission. And from the vault. About mid-morning, the Soviets land at DM, but they are quickly whisked away to a makeshift headquarters in adjoining mobile homes. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. We've heard it said that we are a nation of immigrants, and for many Americans, that is true, with their ancestors surviving overwhelming odds for the promise of liberty. And native peoples were already here. Others came against their will on slave ships. Today, for many, the journey to freedom is an escape from persecution, poverty, and pain. Each one has a story of hope. A month ago, I found a dead person out in the desert. And it really gave me the jolt that I needed to understand how horrendous it is to die from lack of water out in the desert. You know, we, we, we could have prevented this, we could have prevented this, this death. A vast, painful, and violent humanitarian crisis has been unfolding in southern Arizona that is largely ignored and largely erased in the national discourse about immigration. We are a nation of immigrants, but we are also a nation of laws. It is wrong and ultimately self-defeating for a nation of immigrants to permit the kind of abuse of our immigration laws we have seen in recent years, and we must do more to stop it. Families are searching without answers, calling and calling and calling with the terror in their voice of not knowing. And then in the meantime, this national narrative vilifying immigrants and their families. President Trump continues to hammer the issue of illegal immigration. These are people. These are animals. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. It leaves those who are mourning feeling like their tragedy is completely ignored. But know that there's someone who acknowledges that this is happening out there. I'm trying to honor the courage of the people who make the trip and give a voice to the suffering and the dreams and the hopes and the disappointments. And at the same time, point fingers. Hey, this person died here, this one here, this one here. But I don't want that to determine who I am. I don't want to be identified as an activist. I'm an artist. I'm a human being. I react to injustice. Back in the 60s, I was homeless. I came to the U.S. thinking that everything is possible here. Everything is possible here, but it's not that easy. I was born in Colombia, South America. I came from a very poor family, and I knew that my future was limited. I went to Vietnam as an infantryman because that was my only option. 
I didn't want to go back home defeated. Being in the Army sort of helped me get an education, get a job. And I was hired by the government as a, an expert in cultural issues. It wasn't until 1989 that I decided to drop it all and become an artist. When I moved here, I immediately wanted to connect with the people who were putting the wood out in the desert. And I saw the mass of red dots almost covering the geographical detail of the map. I knew right then and there I needed to take that red dot to where the tragedy occurred. Every time they collect the body, they put a GPS mark in where the person was found. So the night before, I look at how am I going to get there? How far are we going to have to walk and be prepared for it? The ultimate goal is to get to the location, one way or another. We try to put four crosses every time we go. The red dot mark a location, and we operate in an area that is 40,000 square miles. We'll stop at three points right at the yeah. left. Yeah. Wait for you. I got an email from a woman whose brother died here. And she says, could you put a cross for my brother? When did he die, I wonder? 2013. I have a friend who's my GPS person who's able to guide us to the exact location. Well, it looks like there might be a couple of ways to connect to it, but the one I think is... Um, Sometimes you have to find... Three miles. ...roads that the map doesn't even show. Right yeah. here. You see it? Okay. Yeah, right here. Okay. Okay, I gotta put this on four-wheel drive. I think the rain collapsed the road. I don't wanna get in here. Okay, so, but you don't wanna get in there either. No, so I'm gonna have to go this way. Right. Most of the migrants who died out in the desert were off the trail. They were left behind, they got lost, disoriented, and they ended up walking in circles until they ran out of water and died. It's a tragedy that has a lot of ramifications. There's a void in that family. No matter what else, first that person was a human being, which is part of why I think Alvaro's work is so important in the sense of remembering and honoring and caring for those who died and disappeared and recognizing them as individual people. Oh, we'll have to get over that ledge at some we point. We may be able to do it up here. That takes us out of our way. Let's try to cross here. And okay, okay, let's try to find a way here. I'm walking along with them. I'm walking the same ground. I'm feeling the same heat. Three feet is okay with me. Do we have a name? Unidentified, undetermined skeletal remains, April 13th, 2018. Half of the time, we don't have the names of the person. And those cases affect me the most. Okay. Because there's no closure for the family. That family still hoping that one day, this person is gonna make a phone call and say, hey, I'm here. We know that that's not gonna happen. And that breaks my heart. This is like a little oasis here, so he probably got here looking for shade and a little cool and just couldn't get up. I knew that these crosses weren't gonna be seen by anybody. The families of those people never get to see them, but every now and then, something magical happens. The 
the family came all the way from New Jersey, her two daughters and her husband. And we went together and put a cross for them. She always tried to help as much as possible. And she inspired so many people, like family members or anyone that needed help. We're trying to build community and circle the person who we lost and the family with care and love. And trying to create mourners where there's silence and there's ghosts and there's desert. I don't have enough life in me to finish it. So it's gonna be an incomplete project, but I'm okay with that because little by little, the truth is coming out. Twelve years ago, mental health worker Eddie Grijalva set out to celebrate Native American sobriety and resilience through a community-based, family-friendly event. Well, his red road to Wellbriety has since become an annual day-long gathering on the Tohono O'odham Nation. The drumming, you know, the, the, the heartbeat of the Mother Earth, to us, that's, you know, life. It's part, part of uh, who we are as a people. A uh, very good morning to everybody. Don't let the rain bother you. I have never seen anybody melt. <laughs> we'll start, uh, of course, as we always do, uh, with uh, honoring the people, first of all, right? On Otham Nation and uh, the Sanavir District for allowing us to gather at the Recreation Center. 12 years! We are at the Sanavir uh, Recreation Center on the Sanavir District of the Tahan Autumn Nation. And we are celebrating what we call the 12th Annual Red Road to Wellbriety Celebration. Protect us wherever we walk upon this Mother Earth. Uh, celebrating recovery in our Native communities. We uh, try to bring an emphasis on uh, that it is possible that people do recover, that people can change their lives. Red Road is a, uh, a term that was coined uh, by Native Americans, kind of is walking the right road, uh, the right way. Everybody knows uh, the difficulties and challenges that most Native communities encounter, but very few people are doing anything to celebrate people who are doing well, people who have changed their lives, and not just you know, changed it. Uh, uh, some of these folks have been clean and sober for 40, 50, 60 years, and uh, we want to honor those people. And we ask people how long they've been clean and sober, and then we do a countdown all the way down to one day. The recovery countdown, where you know we count down the number of years that people have been clean and sober, and these people step up and say, I've got 30 years, 35 years, 40 years. Of course, we have people also step up and say, you know, I've, I've, I've been clean and sober 20 days, uh, 15 days. So it gives them uh, a place where the stigma is sort of removed. And so it gives them, you know, an opportunity when somebody says, look, we're going to celebrate recovery. We're not going to talk about, uh, you know, all the things that, you know, we can't do. What about the things that we can't do? I, myself, am, am in recovery and um, having uh, had some difficult uh, obstacles in my life that I had to face in reality facing them and not just glossing over them and, and uh, thinking that um, there's got to be something better than this. Uh, and beginning in my own recovery and people giving me opportunities, I mean, great opportunities, opening doors for me that I never dreamed possible. So 
My idea then is that, look, if we can uh, put something together where you get more than one person, where you get lots of people doing this, can you imagine the impact it has, you know, in, in our community? I've been participating in the Red Rope for probably about seven years. It means a lot to me because it saved my life. I've been sober six and a half years. This is the longest I've ever been sober. So all of this has to go today because we are not taking it with us. Every year uh, it's a struggle and uh, to raise the funds that we need to uh, put on an event like this. We're always hopeful that uh, next time we put something together and we ask the community to support us, that hopefully they will. Historical trauma has been part of the Native communities for hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds of years. And we believe that by healing one individual at a time, that, uh, that healing goes back seven generations and seven generations forward. So it's something that, you know, everyone heals. When one person heals, the whole community, it's part of the community healing as well. The feeling that people who are struggling have is that they, they, they feel like they're the only ones. And oftentimes they, they've been uh, marginalized, disenfranchised, even from their own family. People need encouragement. Uh, they need somebody to support them. They need somebody to just uh, offer a hand and uh, be able to say to them, look, you can do this, you can do this. And there's opportunities and there's resources in the community to be able to do this so you're, you don't feel alone. The Red Road is something very positive for our people. We're all fighters when we come in here because we fight for that alcohol, we fight for that drug, but we come in here and we fight for our lives when we get here. And just seeing other people doing that very same thing, knowing that where they've been before and sharing our stories, we know we're not alone okay, now. Okay, let's give a hand to everybody who, uh, who With Halloween just behind us, we wanted to share this paranormal moment from a recent visit to Bisbee, Arizona, when an unexplained energy put our lights on the blink and left us wondering, what if? Early on, like in the 80s, people would come here, and one of the th rumors that was always going around was that there was this energy like the Sedona Vortex I mean, Sedona was a, just a little whistle stop at that time, back in the 80s. It was nothing. I was there looking for phonograph records. And, you know, these scenarios of some kind of apocalypse, and this would be a safe haven for people. There is an energy here, though. There's, there's no denying that. <laughs> We're in the Lobster Boy trailer. Brewery Gulch in front of the seance room. I've been working on this trailer for basically three years now. It's from American Horror Story Freak Show. So this was the star trailer. Your building was built in 1904, and you can't deny that you had sort of a paranormal feeling in your space at different times. Yeah, definitely, yeah. You know, a lot of lives were lived in here. People died in here, had experiences in here, and so on. So, you know, there's just that alone, this building would have a lot of energy, as as does a lot of, uh, uh, you, yeah? Oh, my <laughs> light is doing that for some weird reason. <laughs> Never done that before. Hmm. Well, clearly the spirits have spoken. <laughs> spirits, are, you see what I mean? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> That is weird. Do you want to try, is it plugged in or no? It's not even plugged in. Oh, sh <laughs> yeah, That's classic. Oh. 
Veterans Day 2018 will be observed on Monday, November 12th. That's a day to honor and remember all American veterans for their service and sacrifice. And with that, we remember Bill Havens, a U.S. Air Force Korean War veteran. Among his accomplishments, Havens taught at the University of Arizona and established the Department of Landscape Architecture. Idlewild Tower, United Jet Mainliner 803, ready for takeoff, over. We met on, a, on an airplane. I was a flight attendant, stewardess in those days. So there was an empty seat. So I sat down next to him. He looked like he was about 16. And I thought he was an Eagle Scout because he had wings. And it turned out he was an Air Force pilot stationed in Prestwick, Scotland. He was a pilot during the Korean War. He didn't have anything except my name. He wrote a letter two weeks after he got back to Scotland. He was called out on a mission. It was addressed to Joyce Anderson, United Airlines, New York City. And it got to me, and I responded, and the rest is history. He went back to UC Berkeley to finish in architecture, and that turned out to be landscape architecture. We moved to Tucson in 1975 because he had a job opportunity at the university. He would come home every night after work, and this is a, a really unique quality and one that I didn't remember until my sisters brought up because I was so young. He would take 30 minutes and spend with each one of us individually, my two sisters and I, and just be very present and very curious and interested in how our day was. That so was really, really special time that we had. He was a big fan of, of plants and everything botanical. He always claimed that even though he taught at Uni University of Arizona for several decades that he didn't know the plant materials in the desert. And yet we would walk around in our backyard or in the botanical garden or anywhere and he would point out and say the botanical name of these plants and we would look at him and say, I didn't think you knew very many of these plants. He was diagnosed with prostate cancer. His prognosis was for two years. He lived for seven years. He had a lot of radiation, some chemo, not a, a whole lot, but the radiation is what really killed him. At his celebration of life, a lot of his students showed up. We didn't even expect they had heard about the event and they wanted to pay their respects. The Arizona Veterans Memorial Cemetery at Marana was new. Uh, had only been open, I think, less than a year by the time we went to visit as a potential gravesite for my father. Very new, very clean, very well organized, beautiful grounds, kind of in the middle of nowhere. He grew up on uh, farmland in Oklahoma, and there's a lot of farmland around there, so I kind of feel like he's back at home and near Pinal Air Park, and he can actually see the the beautiful Catalina Mountains push ridge from the cemetery. So it was the, the right choice. I really do feel so fortunate to have lived the life I have and I value every day. When the end comes from me, I get to be buried right next to him. That's good too. You can see a large piece of Cold War history here at the Titan Missile Museum in Green Valley. And on that note, 
The Trump administration recently announced plans to withdraw from the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, or INF, alleging that the Russians have been in violation since 2014. Now, that agreement was signed in 1987 by President Ronald Reagan and Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. It was designed to eliminate a particularly destabilizing class of nuclear weapons. Well, here's a look back at 1988, when Soviet inspectors first arrived at Davis-Monthan Air Force Base from the vault. Tucked away in a distant corner of Tucson's Davis-Monthan Air Force Base sits a yard full of cruise missiles. But this group of missiles is here for one reason, to be inspected by a team of Soviet experts to ensure compliance with the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF. About mid-morning, the Soviets land at DM but they are quickly whisked away to a makeshift headquarters in adjoining mobile homes. There, they will work out any last-minute details of this historic dissection of the cruise missiles. Between now and Wednesday, a total of seven launchers will be cut up and packed away. Taking these first steps toward fulfilling the intent of the INF Treaty is important, and the Soviets are the first to admit it. There are about uh, 50,000 uh, nuclear weapons uh, in the world. I mean the Soviet Union and the United States of America possess the huge arsenals of the nuclear weapons. And though maybe it's a small step, but uh, I stress it's a very important step. The scrapping of these missiles, each with a price tag of over a million dollars, is being done with a method that can hardly be called sophisticated. After eyeballing the work of the demolition team, each side cautioned that events like this are just the beginning and still a long way from disarmament. Total fulfillment of this treaty will take nearly 13 years. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. See you next week.